it's nice to uh, nice to be here. Um, so I am speaking uh, th this this mor uh, this morning or wherever you are about uh, Kupaluk, which is in fact the northernmost uh, flyway network site in uh, in the, um, the East East Asian Australasian flyway. Um, and this is really um, not, not my project. Uh, this is a um, uh, a collaboration between the Wildlife Conservation Society, who I work for, and I, I represent WCS uh, in the partnership, um, and also the uh, Bureau of Land Management with the U.S. Department of the Interior. And so this this is a project that's spearheaded by Rebecca McGuire of WCS, um, as well as Martin Robards of WCS, and also Casey Burns of, of the BLM, um, the Bureau of Land Management. And I'm just sort of... Uh, talking about uh, this, this work. So if, if anyone recalls, uh, Kupaluk was established as a flyway network site at MOP9 in Singapore in, in 2017. It's because it, it met three basic criteria for a flyway network site. Um, supported more than 1% of a species population, which was Dunlin, and also supported several threatened species. And this is two eiders, uh, the stellars and the spectacled eiders and also supports more than 20,000 migratory water birds. Uh, Kupaluk is actually a Inupiat word for small shorebird. And it's about a 21,000 hectare area um, in the Northeast corner of the National Petroleum Reserve. Now a National Petroleum Reserve is a land designation that's managed by the Bureau of Land Management. But the focus is really on multiple use and development rather than on pure conservation, like, like a refuge or, or a park. And the habitat is really a mix of low elevation tundra wetlands and, and thaw lakes with uh, slightly higher um, and drier areas of tundra. Now, I assume uh, most people in the flyway know what a Dunlin looks like uh, because many of you likely see them in, uh, in the south, but I figure maybe you don't know what the eiders look like because they tend to stay kind of in the circumpolar area. So on the left there is a Stellar's eider pair, on the right is a male um, uh, uh, spectacled eider. So uh, zooming in a little closer um, to, uh, to Kupaluk, um, you can see what, what sort of what the area, what the landscape looks like, and also see where it is. Now, so the rationale for establishing Kupaluk, uh, especially where it is, is because it really, at least when it established it, it avoided any real or perceived conflict with other potential land uses. Uh, the red dots here uh, on this map are, are camps or cabins. So Kupaluk was an area that, that, that didn't really overlap with any of those. And it was in an area already identified as unavailable to leasing and with no new non-subsistence subsistence infrastructure allowed. And so the idea was by selecting a small polygon in this non-controversial area, conflict should be minimized. Now, there has, however, been rec more recently increased interest by oil and gas developers in this region as a whole. And there's a real imperative right now to provide managers with information they need to inform good management decisions. So while the BLM is already working with regional stakeholders on some of this, um, a lot of the, the, this data is lacking for many areas and for many species. So the work we're doing at Kupaluk can, um, can really fill in some of these knowledge gaps. Um, and so the idea here is really just to tell you about what we've done so far. Uh, again, this is only established in 2017. So kind of to go over what's happened um, since then. So uh, one nice thing about Kupaluk is that the management that, I, that we're, we, we want to do there is essentially, it fits very well with flyway uh, network site management. And the idea is to ensure water bird values of the site are maintained or even improved where possible. And it's important to recognize that subsistence use is not only allowed, but encouraged as part of the management there. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's, it's important to, to recognize uh, the logistical challenges of working in the northern part of the flyway in places like Chukotka in Russia and, and in the, um, the, uh, the Alaskan Arctic as well. So Kupaluk can only be reached by plane like this one or helicopter in the summer or by snowmobile in the winter. And so in order to set up a field season, the first thing that happens is in winter when there's still snow cover, uh, so some, of the, some of the heavier equipment is snowmobiled out at a distance of about 100 miles each direction, and then just left there. It's, it's cached and, and, wait, and uh, left there until spring. And then in spring, 
um, a crew of, in, in late May, uh, the, the, uh, crew, the crew of two to four people is brought in by, by plane um, over, over the course of several flights. These are, these are small planes and they can't carry a lot of, a lot of weight with them. Um, and so then over the two to six week field season, uh, resupplies are done by, by planes uh, that, that have floats that then land on these, these lakes, these thaw lakes once they're uh, more, more fully thawed. So in 2018, there was a three-person three crew, including uh, the lead authors here, Rebecca Benson and Casey Burns. And the, the first idea was really to just try to figure out where they could possibly set up a camp, like what could be the, the base site for future long-term monitoring at this site. And they also conducted uh, 22 10-minute point counts in late June in the southern part, about a 36 square kilometer area, which are represented by those, those red dots in the bottom there. Um, and so these are the, um, the eight species they saw and, and the, uh, the total counts. So mo mostly what they were seeing were the pectoral sandpipers and the red phalaropes. So um, uh, the team, well, a team returned in 2019 um, uh, with four people in the middle of June uh, uh, for two weeks. And this is also just to show you what the living, con living conditions are like, right? And people, they live in tents uh, and so each, Researcher usually has their own tent, and then there's also a, uh, a, a camp tent or an office tent that, that's separate from, from those other ones. And everything is surrounded by bear fences. These are you know, relatively lightweight uh, electrical fences, um, electric shock fences to keep uh, curious bears away from, away from tents. And then the crew checks in with people in Fairbanks in Alaska at the head WCS office. Um, every day by in reach, which is like a it's a satellite texting, and then once a week by by satellite phone. So a big development in the 2019 field season was to identify a, a really good lake to land on for resupplies with with the with the float plane, and you can see sort of see a little star there on, on a on a on a lake, and so by by landing there uh, and setting camp right in kind of in the middle of Kupaluk, that's that's a really good position. Um, to be able to access all other parts uh, of, of uh, the Flyway Network site. They're all more or less equidistant uh, from, that, from that one place. So in 2019, uh, in collaboration with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and with Manomet, uh, uh, we tagged, we deployed uh, six satellite tags, three on pectoral sandpipers and three on red phalaropes. And these are species that use the Americas Flyway. So these are not ones that go over on uh, the East Asian Australasian Flyway. Um, and one thing, uh, and we also continue point counts. And so while in general, uh, logistics can be challenging um, in, in reaching the site and in just you know, doing field work and uh, having supplies, uh, one really big benefit of working on the breeding grounds is that the birds here are relatively easy to catch. I mean, you can really, because of breeding behaviors, you can really target uh, not just specific species, but specific individuals um, because you know they're going to be sticking near their nests or, or doing these display behaviors or engaging activities that make them uh, much more susceptible to, to capture for uh, for this type of study. So that's uh, that's important. So there were point counts, and uh, there were 34 species of bird found using the site uh, in this in the second year. Um, so uh, half the crew in 2019 were from Nat Geo, National Geographic. There was a, a freelance uh, um, science writer and a photographer that came. Um, and so that uh, their trip to, to the site resulted in, a, in, in, a, in an article that's, uh, the link is there um, to, to this Nat Geo um, article. So, you know, this year, you know, we didn't do any field work because of COVID. Uh, we have, of course, had plans. Uh, many, um, many crews who intended to do field work in Alaska did, did not, including us. So things have kind of been merged and combined into what we have coming up for 2021. And so the first thing we want to do is really understand nest densities and species composition of the birds we're finding here relative to the 15 type, types of different habitat that are, um, that are found there. Um, the second is to really evaluate factors influence, shore, influencing shorebird nest survival here, you know, this basically undisturbed site in relation to three more disturbed sites. Um, the third objective is to engage local, regional, international interests through compelling communication of this work. Um, and so here, what we, what we have planned, we have a, a professional filmmaker 
as well as one, one or two Alaskan youth uh, videographers are planning to come up to Kupaluk to, to make a film about the work with a focus really on raising public awareness of this flyway network site and building an understanding of the connectivity to, to other sites. And then the, the fourth goal is to tag some, some Dunlin with geolocators um, to, to better understand uh, how the birds from, from Alaska are using the East Asian Australasian flyway. So, um, and you know, um, we are interested in developing, finding a, a nice sister site for, uh, for Kupaluk. So if, if anyone out there is interested in, in this, uh, please do contact Casey Burns at BLM. His contact information is here. Um, I think it's really important um, to be able to make these linkages. Um, you show that you know, the same, same exact birds, you know, same species are, you know, have this, sh uh, this shared um, migratory experience. And I think that's, I think that's important. So um, you know, as far as you know, lessons so far, it, it is, uh, we're still very early days in, in what we've been doing. You know, it's, it's tough, especially having lost a field season to come up with any you know, definitive lessons. But one thing that's already really clear is that uh, you know, nowhere is safe for protection. You know, there's, there's so much conservation focus on Southeast Asia, you know, on the Yellow Sea, you know, these places where there are just these pressing, pressing conservation uh, interventions that are, that are necessary. But um, the northern part of the flyway, you know, uh, in Russia and in Alaska, these are often, uh, from my perspective, they're, they're overlooked because ah, it's, it's far away, it's remote. But you know, as, as I said earlier, like even in, in just the past few years, there's been already increased interest in this area uh, for development. And so I think that you know, it's really important to identify these sites, work to understand why they're important, and build networks across the flyway to advocate for their protection. So um, that's what I have, Rick. Um, I will I will stop sharing. Um, if there's uh, if there are any questions right now, I'm happy to happy to take them.